listening to Finding Your Genius Zone with Dirk Nouvelle. It's not just a job. It's not just a paycheck. Or at least it doesn't have to be. With the help of experts across industries, Dirk helps you find your passion and career, as well as exposing the unknown parts of every vocation. Let's go deep. Let's find your genius zone right now. Here's Dirk Nivelle. Everybody, this is Dirk Nivelle. I'm on with a good friend of mine, Roger Bodwin. Uh, a little bit about Roger. Roger and I, uh, years ago, I moved to Sun Valley with my family, um, kind of tried something different, moved them down, put our kids in school. And Roger was one of the guys that I met uh, in the beginning. Uh, he had a couple daughters in the, in the same school, same age range, and we became really close. We, uh, we skied a lot together. We had, you know, we'd have wine, hang out, talk about everything from A to Z. And he's just one of those guys that stuck with me. I really liked, liked who he was. I liked the story. And, uh, Roger is in, you know, as far as what he does, uh, he's in the restaurant world. So he's done, he's worn a lot of hats as far as coaching, um, teaching curriculum. Um, he's got a podcast uh, in that industry, his own restaurants. But he's just a really overall interesting guy, and, and I think he can provide a lot of value. So I'm going to throw it back to Roger. And Roger, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, if you were to describe what you do, uh, we can start there. Yeah, so what I'm doing now really centers around um, 23 years of experience in starting and operating restaurants. Um, we had five different concepts over that time period. And it, I really have to credit my wife, Thea, because I wouldn't have thought of any of this stuff on my own. I was really successful in the restaurant business in applying business skills to a business that isn't traditionally run by MBAs. And, and we systemized our restaurants and we had a lot of success from that. So I created a bunch of training systems, both in staff training, and then I put systems in place to maximize profit and profitability and all that sort of stuff. But once we decided, or I should say it was Thea's idea to sell those restaurants and really focus on just changing our life. And, and that's when we moved to Sun Valley. And this was probably five years ago when we first met. But, you know, back then, I, I'm not a very tech savvy person. You know, I'm the old school bricks and mortar, build the business and own the operation kind of thing. And uh, and she said, you've got so much knowledge in your head about running restaurants. She's like, we could make a company around this and like just put content together. And it's a global world right now. And everything is digital. And I didn't know the difference between a podcast and a webinar back then. And now I'm a podcast host, just as you are. So I'll credit Thea for the idea. But now um, it's, it's sort of evolved into multiple things. So besides having a podcast, um, it's called the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. Um, we've been doing that literally for five years, and we've released about 335 episodes over that time. And every every week I have a, a new release and we interview lots of guests, but I'm also an industry speaker. And one of the things that's really satisfying is, is helping give back to an industry that was really good to me and and helping others succeed. And, and I don't need to tell a lot of people out there that the restaurant business is probably one of the most challenging businesses you can be in and the failure rate is super high. And, and then we all went through the pandemic and all that kind of stuff, which was devastating to our industry. So whenever I can get in front of an audience and speak and share knowledge and information and just help them, you know, help anyone move their business forward, that's really what I'm all about. So podcast host, industry speaker, I do some personal restaurant coaching on a fairly limited basis, anything from staff training to profitability to, you know, human relations and building dream team staffs and leadership. I do all of that. I'm doing some of that right now. And then uh, I've also written a couple of books. One is restaurant specific. And then the other one is about sort of an obsession I've had with mountain climbing and, and climbing the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So that's kind of what we do now. So interesting a lot of hats um i guess when you're talking i'm thinking you know what is it about the the whole world of restaurants um you know i throw bars in there yeah uh, food related i mean there's something there that's brought you in and was that something that developed at a young age or was that something that uh translated over the years well to answer that question really, really methodically, it, it did start when I was in high school because I did work for a, a private country club, you know, and professionals, doctors, lawyers, and, you know, business owners, and it was a private golf club, you know, and, and my very first job in high school was a dishwasher. And I did that for about, I don't know, 
a month or so. And the owners saw something really special in me and they immediately promoted me to bartender. And they, they literally had me trained to become a bartender. And that's where the hospitality thing really came out. And not that I could have defined that word back then as I can now, but to me, it was all about a point of pride in, in treating people special and making them feel like they were, you know, the best customer in the place. And all these people, like I said, all the business owners and the professional people would come in after a round of golf and I would serve them in, you know, in the lounge, every golf course has what they call the 19th hole. Right. But mm -hmm. I also worked in the restaurant. So I would be the service bartender for the restaurant while I'm serving these people. And I got to know them on a first name basis. And it became quite lucrative because every time I'd make them a drink and treat them special, you know, they throw money at you. And that was great. And yeah, everyone appreciates that, of course, but it went beyond that. It was really a point of pride in not only doing the job well, but really delivering that real hospitality. But I never, ever thought I'd be in the restaurant business. That that came much later. Yeah. So that's, in, that's really interesting because a lot of the, the conversations I've had in my podcast are about you know, they're really aimed at helping young adults, people struggling to try to figure out what they want to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many voices in your head, you know, especially as a, as a kid, you know, you're, you're trying to maybe just get your first job so you can get your apartment or a new car, or maybe you want to start a family. And so sometimes the voices are other voices. Uh, and people sometimes in my observation, they don't pay attention to like the natural innate things that you have, the interests, the skills, what you're drawn to. So at your age, you had this interest and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, you, you had big energy around um, providing an experience for people. I did like. for sure. Yeah. But you know, I yeah. have to say, again, the rest, the whole restaurant hospitality thing did happen much later, but opportunities happened to me in college and in graduate school that sort of shaped my thinking. Okay. And it really became centered around entrepreneurial opportunities. Even though I did have jobs back then, I had businesses in college and that sort of shaped my life and, and moved me in a certain direction. And then when I was in graduate school, I had an opportunity to um, live and work in, in Italy for the summer doing an internship. And that's kind of what opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And I became really enamored of pizza because I was living in Italy and I was traveling throughout Italy and doing all this kind of stuff. And, you know, you can't walk down a street without there being 10 really cool pizzerias. And it was all about wood burning brick ovens and I was really captivated by eating a lot of pizza. And I never thought again, I'd be in the restaurant business until I ended up um, having a job interview at a ski resort in Maine that was sort of an anomaly, Dirk, because I was used to skiing major Vermont ski resorts that were fully developed, where a large ski resort had an access road with lots of bars and restaurants and retail shops and condominiums. And, you know, you got the whole infrastructure that is supported by the large numbers of skiers that go there. And I go in, in 1994 on this job interview to this very large ski resort in Maine, and it's like a time warp. It's like the ski area is there, and a lot of people go there in the winter, and there's this tiny little town that had just a handful of businesses, and they're all just completely overrun with business in the winter, and none of them did a particularly good job of delivering hospitality or delivering service or delivering a sophisticated product. They just succeeded in spite of themselves. And I remember walking into a number of these businesses and being really disappointed saying, what's wrong with this picture? But driving through this town on the way to the job interview, I'm kind of looking around, comparing my experiences in Vermont, saying, where are the bars and the restaurants and the retail shops and the condos? There's virtually nothing here. And that's when this idea popped in my head about all the pizza in Italy and this place that I was obsessed with in Switzerland. And I'm like, if you were to shape that place or pick it up and, and put it in any ski resort town in America, it would rock and roll. But here's the place to do it because it needs everything. So I had really grandiose visions about recreating one of these European experiences in this ski town, even though I'm interviewing for a job. And it worked out in that I still got the job, but it took three or four interviews and multiple trips back before I was actually hired. But every time I came back to this small town, I'm writing this business plan about creating this restaurant, you know, because here's the opportunity, whether I get the job or not. And then that's literally how the restaurant started. So I took the job. It was in marketing at a ski resort. And simultaneously, we're shopping this business plan around trying to get funding. And, 
and this is the funny story. It's like, in order to do something right, I saw a really beautiful piece of land that was for sale. And I wanted to build a building and I wanted to create this amazing restaurant because the location was spectacular and, and all the traffic had to pass by it on the way to the ski resort and everything about the land was perfect. So I, I wrote this business plan that literally asked for a million dollars and started shopping it around to commercial banks looking for a, a, a loan or a lender to fund it. And the very first question, as anyone listening to the podcast can imagine, is so how many restaurants or bars have you ever owned or managed before? And I'm like, well, I've never been in the restaurant business, but read the business plan. It's a great idea. And it's going to, you know, it's going to rock and roll. So, of course, I got laughed out of about 15 different bankers offices. And then a lucky opportunity happened in that there was a banker that worked for a very large bank at the time that happened to ski this resort every single weekend and knew the opportunity was there and knew that all these businesses were overrun with business that they couldn't handle. And, you know, you, it could support 10 more restaurants at that time. And he knew that I could run a business because I had an MBA from a really solid business school, but bankers being as conservative as they are, he read my business plan. He's like, you're right. This is a great idea. Do I think it can work? <laughs> yes. Um, am I going to give you a million dollars? No. <laughs> so he's like, if you scale this project way back, I, I'll i probably be able to give you about $150,000. So you really can't do much with 150. You certainly can't build a, you know, build a building and buy land and outfit it with equipment or anything. You got to find a lease space in order to, you know, start it. So the place we ended up finding was like six miles away from the ski resort on the wrong side of the railroad tracks with a leaky roof and bad parking and everything under the sun. But true to the original vision, we created a wood-fired pizzeria in that space, and it was an overnight success. And then everything just kind of grew from there. So that's kind of how I got into the restaurant business, never thinking I'd be in the restaurant business. See, that's a great story. I'm, you know, you're giving me another thing to kind of throw out there to the audience is, you know, you didn't have a clear, I mean, you had a vision, but you didn't know how you were going to get there. And, you know, I think sometimes people ignore that voice inside their head or their heart where they, they really kind of have a dream or they, they know what they want to do. And that, you know, you took action, right. And you didn't give up. And I think that's, you know, I, I guess you call that grit. Uh, you could call it a lot of things, but maybe you could, is there any advice you could give to somebody that's kind of coming out of school or in their twenties, thirties, and they have a dream, a vision, but they just keep getting knocked down or whatever there's fear or there's just something that's stopping them from doing it. Like, I would think that's common, right? I think a lot of people out there. Yep. So what's your advice to somebody that might be in that situation and, and they really want to see something through, but they keep getting knocked down? Well, my biggest mistake that will be a regret, I guess, would be I was always following or chasing money versus passion or, or what was really in my heart. And part of that was this business school experience that I had, I went to a very competitive business school and all the people that came out of there were thinking, oh, I'm going to be the CEO of a fortune 500 company, or I'm going to start some super successful business. And it was this ultra competitive place. And when you graduated from there, it's like everyone was chasing these high end consulting positions or wall street or finance or this or that. And everyone was chasing money. This was 1988, 89 back then. So the eighties were very much about, you know, materialistic things thinking and money and success and power and all that. And you get swept up in that, I think, or at least I did. And so I, I definitely went down that road for a while and, and I found a lot of hard knocks and lumps and it didn't really work out for me very well. And I remember wanting to become or getting involved in real estate development at the time, that was kind of a hot career, you know, all these luxury skyscrapers going up and all these high flying developers building these buildings and all that. And I thought, oh, I want to do that, you know? And it's, I, I found out that it became like, it's kind of like this who you know kind of thing. And unless you went to the absolute best business schools at the time, people thought it was the Wharton School of Business or Harvard Business School. Those types of jobs only recruit or hire people that have those ultra echelon degrees from the very best schools. And I couldn't, and I, and I got rejected after rejected after rejected. And then I went after consulting jobs because I had this taste of consulting when I was working in Italy for the summer. And although that was a really demanding and challenging project and opportunity, 
you know, it's like, okay, this is what I did for the last three months in Italy. Yeah. So what, you know, <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't able to do those things. So I had to take a step back and someone said, well, if you get a job in commercial banking, then you, you know, you could make networking connections in both consulting and real estate development. So you need a stepping stone. So I'm like, okay, I'll do that. I interviewed for a bunch of banking jobs. I got hired by Oddly enough, I mentioned the bank that ended up funding my first restaurant is the bank that I worked for long before the restaurant happened. I was there for about two months and it was like going back to college again because it was a it was a commercial lending training program. And even though I had you know, an advanced degree in business and all this, suddenly I'm back in school and you're taking finance and economics and accounting classes and all week you're in school. And then on Monday of every week after the weekend, you got a major exam. So you couldn't even enjoy your weekends. You're studying all the time. I just didn't fit in. And it became very obvious to my supervisors that this guy just doesn't fit. Everyone else is thriving in the program. And I'm like, really, I'm in school again. I remember my boss coming to me one day, like only five weeks into this program, and he hands me a box. He's like, clear out your desk. It's like, it's been noticed by the people up above that you're just not thriving. You just don't belong here. He's like, you really need to start your own business. So good luck to you, kid. You know, it's like, here you go. <laughs> and that's really probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because that put me back on this sort of, sort of entrepreneurial path. And then that's kind of what led to the next step. So if there's any lesson in this, it's yeah. follow your heart and don't chase the money because the money will follow. If you're doing what you truly love to do, and I'm not the first person to give this advice, you know, life is a journey. It is not a destination. A lot of good and, you know, good, bad, and everything in between happens to you. But if you follow your heart and what's truly your passion and what you really love to do, the dreams you talked about, if you can somehow get yourself involved in that industry and Everything in this world, no matter how obscure it may seem, is a business. So anything that you love to do is a business somehow, some way. And that's what you need to do and get as much experience as you can. And, you know, be on the lookout for opportunities along the way that other people might not be looking for. The standard mindset today is, OK, go to college, get a good, you know, get a degree, then go find a good job and build security and stability. And there's so many people in this world that work for a living. They don't work for a life and, and they don't have a lifestyle and they hate what they do. And that's to me, the worst thing that can happen to you. It's like, we're on this earth for a short period of time. You should just follow your heart and, and just be as happy and fulfilled as you can be. And I made that mistake and lost a lot of years because I went down the wrong path. Yeah. So one thing you said that said a lot of cool stuff, but one thing that I can relate to is just the attachment to money Yeah, uh, in terms of yep. defining success. For sure. Um, what Was that a voice in you know, your father, a friend? Like where, where did that, where did the voice or where did that um, attachment come from? If you can remember. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's interesting because my, my beginnings were middle-class, you know, my father came out of, um, the Korean War, and he and my my favorite uncle took over my grandfather's trucking company. I wouldn't call them entrepreneurs, but they they did build the trucking company up from what it was when my grandfather had it. But my father worked hard his entire life with his hands. You know, he drove semi trucks. They had a moving company. They moved people's furniture in the winter time. They cleared big factory parking lots with snow removal, driving bucket loaders and plows. And he'd be out at four, you know, four o'clock yeah. in the morning. So he had his own business and he worked for himself, but he worked very hard. My mother, um, you know, she was a stay at home mom when I was born. Uh, you know, she left a career she had. Uh, she was an executive secretary for a very large game company called that used to be called Milton Bradley. It was taken over by Hasbro. But then she became a stay at home mom. But she was very savvy and very frugal and mostly financial. So she made all the money and made the most of the money my father made by investing, you know, and I watched all this and my mom went to the same business school that I went to undergrad and stuff. And I just kind of pulled it out of a hat when it was time to decide where to go to college. I mean, that's a story unto itself. My yeah. passion in life at the time, I thought I wanted to be a commercial airline pilot. I was really enamored with flying and aviation and all this kind of stuff. And as it turns out, I became too tall uh, to actually become a commercial airline pilot, being six foot six and all that kind of stuff. And I got accepted to all these flying schools right out of high school. I was going to 
you know, become a pilot. And my parents were at this cocktail party like three weeks before I was supposed to go to Daytona Beach, Florida flying school. Um, my parents are having a conversation with a commercial pilot. And I was at the party at, at the time and they introduced me to him and I'm towering over this guy. And the guy looks at me and says, how tall are you now? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm six foot six. He's like, wow. He's like, there's a, there's a height restriction, right? And six foot five is like the max. And he's like, you could grow, to, you're not even 18 yet. You could be three more inches and then you'll never, my parents pulled the plug on that. And they're sorry, you're not going to flying school. It's like one cocktail party changed my life. And I, I wasn't able to do that. So I just pulled, okay, mom went to Bryant college for business. I guess I'll go study business and all that kind of stuff. So it's funny how yeah. life takes its twists and turns, but in terms of f money and, and chasing that, I think it was very definitely um, wanting to live a certain lifestyle. I was a huge skier back then um, when I was in graduate school. An advisor of mine had a really cool ski house at the base of this mountain, and we would do you know weekend trips. and And you know, this guy was our advisor in a, in a certain class. And I remember just like sitting in this guy's hot tub at the base of this mountain, looking up at the trails at night and watching the grooming machines going down. And it's like, I want that. It's like, I want a ski house at the base of the mountain and I want to live this lifestyle and I want to travel to Europe because I'd been to Europe and I want to live a life of adventure and do all these cool things. And I realized at that point that I really couldn't do those things by having a regular job because yeah. you're tied down to a regular job that doesn't give you the freedom. You might make the money, but you don't have the time. And it's like, I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it without any restrictions. And so that sort of fueled the entrepreneurial thing too. But it wasn't until graduate school, like I said, when everything was so competitive and everyone just was, it was just all about making money. So it just kind of piled on its on itself. And, and I got out of graduate school thinking, yeah, I want to be successful, but I also want to live this exciting life. And all those things happened, but it happened later in life. And, you know, I've had plenty of ups and downs, failures, successes, you name yeah. it. It's And it's still happening to me. Sure. I think it always does. So, you know, you just talked about something. And this is, this is what I'm trying to uncover uh, with these podcasts is thinking about how you like to spend your life. And, you know, when I was 24, I was thinking about things like money and moving up the ladder and image and all those superficial things and you know i'm a little embarrassed to admit it but that was my dad's voice and i was trying to please him but you know freedom like yeah. so my question is about getting back to the restaurant business like there are certain things that we all need in our jobs you know whether it's making an impact um uh, serving um you know things for me i i really love my freedom i didn't realize how important that was you know, the ideas of waking up with my kids, going to bed with my kids, coaching Absolutely. my kids in sports. Um, you know, I love to travel, but honestly, I don't like being away from my family. Uh, my wife, you know, I have a farm. Um, but, you know, at, at a young age, I didn't know that. I didn't, that wasn't apparent to me. But so for me, like, I think one of the things that I'm trying to get young adults thinking about are like the the the, the life you want, you know, do you want to work with a lot of people or do you want to be an architect where you can go into a room and do your own thing? Do you want to be pulled away from your family? Do you want freedom? Do you want your compensation to be capped? Um, do you want to deal with the BS of politics of a, a boss cutting your uh, commission and raising your quota? So getting into your world, the restaurant business, there are probably two or three, maybe more things that are kind of like um, must haves, like things that you need as part of a career. I'm guessing freedom is one of them. Your ability to like, you know, go climb a mountain or go skiing or whatever. What are the things that you get out of being in the restaurant business? And I guess there's different flavors of being in the restaurant business. You could be a waiter or a bartender where you're, you know, attached to a specific geography. But for people that are looking at getting into the restaurant business, what kind of things will that allow them you know, what, what is that going to give them? And on the same token, what won't it give them? So like not to push people away from the restaurant business, yes. but what okay. are some things that you've seen from people who are like, you know what, they, they weren't a good fit, just like you weren't in that commercial lending uh, world that your boss acknowledged. What are some things that maybe you've seen where like, hey, if you're like this, this might not be the right route for you? Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but let's start with someone just getting out of school or a young person hospitality is one of those careers that you can live an amazing lifestyle 
anywhere in the world and you can continue to move around in it. So you can literally go work in Bali, Indonesia or Tokyo, Japan, or just about anywhere. And you can work in the restaurant or hospitality business. You learn life skills in this business. You learn how to interact with people. You learn salesmanship skills, all sorts of things that you learn. It's got camaraderie and team spirit. And it's, yeah, I mean, and it's fun and it's glamorous to some people. And it's just exciting because you're constantly meeting new people and there's so many different careers within it. So sure, that's one aspect that's got the freedom attached to it. You can make really good money, especially bartending. Bartending is very lucrative. Being a server in high-end restaurants, you can make a very good living doing so. But it's also the career that you don't need a formal education to rise to the very top of the industry. And I'll give you an example. So my very first employee in my very first restaurant, I told you I opened six miles away from the ski resort with the leaky roof and all that kind of stuff. He was a 15 year old kid. He was my very first employee that I hired and he was a dishwasher. And he quickly moved his way up through the different kitchen positions. But within three weeks of starting this job as a dishwasher, he had initiative and he had ambition and he was trustworthy. And he basically said, hey, you know, I'm happy to take on always wanted to learn and always wanted to do more, you know. And so within three weeks, he's literally closing the restaurant so I could go home early at night. And he'd put the you know, he'd set the alarm and lock the door and make sure all the lights were off. And and he'd send the credit card batch. He'd do all this stuff as a dishwasher at 15. And I could trust him to do so. And over the years, this kid stayed with me for 15 years. He became the kitchen manager in two of my restaurants. And when he left me 15 years later at age 30, he left to start his own restaurant, you know, and he never went to college and a really smart kid, but a really ambitious kid. But he was constantly wanting me to mentor him and teach him things in the finance side of business and this, that, and the next thing. So you're only limited by your ambition and and your interest in something and you can go anywhere with it, literally any business or any career but the key is to stand apart you know to really set yourself apart from everyone else you're working with because that's really how you rise up in any organization that's really how you get anywhere in life you want to set yourself apart and not be just one of the crowd you know it's like and i found that to be true and it goes way back to that you know, country club job I had for some reason, I set myself apart. I didn't try to do it. Maybe, maybe it was personal character. Maybe it was because I was just super polite to the owners and it was genuine politeness, not, you know, being yes person to them. And okay, I like this kid and I'm going to give him some more responsibility. We'll see how he does. And then I thrived in that position, you know, and I was there for two years of high school and, and it turned out to be a really good opportunity for me. So if there's any advice there, it's really about, you know, about following your heart, having ambition, keeping an eye out for opportunity and setting yourself apart from the competition. Really? I love it. I love it. So a couple of things maybe that stand out where you're like, hey, you know what? Um, like in my world, I, I, I'm a, a real estate lender. And if somebody was to clearly articulate that I would be starting over every month, um, you know, versus someone who could build a book of business, like a financial advisor or commercial insurance, I think I might have thought differently about this career that I'm in. You know, are there anything anything that sticks out that any surprises you've had over the years about being exposed to this industry that you might I don't want to say warn people about, but maybe make sure that they're really knowledgeable uh, to you know maybe it's not the right fit for them. Um, maybe you've seen people that don't fit. And if so, what were some of the personality traits of those people? Uh, you know, maybe they're introverts. Maybe they don't get along with people. Maybe they don't like to share. Uh, I don't know what those things are, but can you think yeah. of anything? Yeah, I mean, I could tell lots of stories about people that we've hired, people we've worked with, people that are unscrupulous, people that were there for the wrong reasons. Maybe they were just in it for the paycheck, but they really didn't care about serving the public or meeting new people. You know, maybe they just, we're looking for a job and they didn't really know what the restaurant business is about. I mean, you, you get all kinds, but right. you know, we had very high standards and the way we ran the business sort of, you know, leveled the playing field quickly. You either knew if you fit or you didn't. Um, you kind of voted yourself off the Island because the, 
the dream team that we built had also those same high standards. There was a healthy competition. People were really into delivering great experiences and selling products for the restaurant. It's not just about being an order taker. When you're a front of house server or a bartender, it's not just about giving somebody a menu and letting them decide what they want. It's about knowing that there are first time visitors to our to our restaurants and operations every single day who may not, not know the very first thing about what's great, what's special, what they'll enjoy. And we're really doing them a disservice if we're not knowledgeable about all the products we sell, what's unique and special and different. I call those things hooks. And if you're not entertaining the clients and the customers and the guests, then you don't belong there because I, 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 to this day, I believe that the restaurant business is show business. It's about entertainment and everyone that interacts with a guest or a customer, I call them guests, is really an actor or an actress on stage there to dazzle the guests and give them lots of reasons to come back again and to give them amazing dining experiences. And you can't do that if you don't apply yourself, if you don't have ambition, if you don't learn and study all the products and know as much as you can about both the menus and the restaurant. And those were some of the standards we had. And that was one of the reasons why we were so successful. It's like everyone walking through the door felt special. It's that cheers formula. People want to go where everyone knows their name. And that was one of the keys to our success. So if you're interested in hospitality, that's part of how you stand apart from everyone else. You you learn as much as you can and you interact with guests and you treat them like an old friend, even if they're a first time visitor. You introduce yourself by name, you build a relationship with them, and then you tell them about everything you believe they're going to enjoy and turn them on to a great experience. And in so doing, the restaurant makes more money, the person makes more money, and the guest has a better experience. And that's kind of the key to it. I love it. So, you know, I know you're also coaching, right? You you yeah. you are mm-hmm. working with people for various reasons, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. But my assumption is you're trying to help them run uh, restaurants more effectively. Right. Um, you know, I know uh, I had an interview the other day from a teacher and coach and and he talked a lot about um no, I'm sorry. This was a realtor that's turned his realtor business into a coaching. So he coaches realtors on how to run their businesses like a business because they're so good at the real estate side in terms of presenting and whatever. But in terms of the running a PL and the day to day, they're not maybe so skilled in that um, area. So have you seen like you see people that might have skill sets that are really good at cooking or delivering or, or providing an experience? But you must also see maybe um, a lack of business savvy. Is is that yes. kind of so? It is true. Um, so yeah, what is that about? I mean, what exactly? I, I don't want to stereotype, but what would you say is most common for people in the hospitality world? What are they missing in terms of the A to Z as far as running a business effectively? Well, I also call this business, besides being show business, I call it the business of a thousand details because there literally are. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Our end goal, obviously, is to deliver really great products, food and drink to our guests, really dazzle them, give them great experiences. But in order to do that... um, there is the human relations component. There's the marketing component. There's the finance component. You know, there's all those critical details that either make a restaurant financially viable or not. And there's every kind of restaurant under the sun. There are those super savvy, um, technologically heavy um, restaurants with savvy operations and management. Mostly those are the biggest chains in this in this world that have every little cost dialed right down to the penny. You know, the cost of a soda straw, you know, they've got all the systems dialed. And then there's the mom and pops or the independent restaurants that are running one single location. And maybe it was a passion or mom was a great cook or dad likes to be the chef. But just because you can put a nice, you know, a delicious dish in front of a guest doesn't mean you can run a financially savvy business. And there's so many things that you need to do. You need to be very wary of of your food and your beverage and your labor costs, because those are the three biggest expenses in a restaurant. And you have to be able to have volume coming through that restaurant. You have to be able to turn over your tables quickly to maximize sales. But every item you sell also has to be profitable. And today the challenge is um, two things, rising food costs and the highest labor costs we've ever had to pay in, in restaurants, which shrinks margins in a business that already has a 
you know, a, a limited margin to it. So unless you're super savvy at maximizing profit and squeezing, you know, every nickel of profit out of the place and really turning your tables and building a brand, that's another mistake people make. You know, they don't necessarily brand their business. They just, they run a restaurant. They don't, they don't run a business and they're not building a brand. They're just running a restaurant. And that's a paradigm shift, but I see a lot of that. And so, you know, so we work with those people and, and, if you build a brand, you're more likely to have a following and have an aura around something that is, you know, driven by social media, driven by the experiences that you're offering and all that. And, you know, we can always tell you can walk into any restaurant anywhere and you can know if the place is dialed or if it's just chaos, you know, based on what you see when you walk in the door and how happy the staff are, how happy the other guests are. You know, so you got these independent restaurants, you got the largest national chains, you've got savvy restaurant groups that have five, six, seven, eight, ten different concepts, all managed by one restaurant group, and literally everything in between. But I mean, think about it. I mean, it's such a diverse industry. Every single nationality and race is represented, both in ownership and in employees. It's very, very diverse. And that that is an appeal as well, you know. But yeah. Unfortunately, there is definitely a lack of, of, you know, yeah, financial savvy, operational savvy. Sometimes a chef, you know, has worked for other restaurants his entire life. He's always wanted to put his name on the door and have his, his own place. But then suddenly, oh, OK, I got my own place now. And now suddenly I've got to be a marketing expert, a finance expert. I got to be great with dealing with people, hiring and firing and policies and legalities and, and licensing and thousand details. Right. Yeah, I'd say I just my, want to cook the food. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. Like my business, I was just thinking how many different skill sets are involved with getting a loan funded, you know, all the different people that touch a file. Um, as we wind this down, Roger, yeah. um, I wanted to a couple more things. I wanted to kind of I always ask this question, but you're 60, right? I'm 60 and I'm mm -hmm. 52 and we're kind of, you know, at that age where uh, we, I, I think we feel a little wise, maybe we have years of experience. If you were to turn back the clocks, go back, you know, say 23, 24 years old, um, you know, knowing what you know now, would you do anything different? Um, would you stay in the hospitality world? Sounds like you would. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost an unfair question because sometimes you have to have life experience to know where you want to go, but knowing sure. what you know now, uh, and you, let's say you bump into somebody that's thinking about getting into hospitality and they ask you the question, you know, would you do it again? What would your response be? Well, you know, I could have gone down two paths, you know, clearly I told you my hospitality story and, and it all turned out well, and it's given me the freedom and, and, and it's given me a lot of new opportunities that I'm still very excited about. No, I don't see myself retiring at 65 or anytime soon. Right. But I also mentioned this passion for skiing that I had. And one of my other young person jobs was working at a small ski area in my hometown in Massachusetts where I grew up. And I literally worked every job at that ski area. You know, I was, I worked in the ski shop. I worked in the rental shop. I was an instructor. I was the ticket manager and I loved skiing. I had such a passion for that. And I carried that with me to this day. And at one point, um, before I started the restaurant, that's another one of those ups and downs that you don't expect. I actually had my dream job in the ski industry. And I was the director of product services for a company that imported skis, boots, and um, bindings from Europe. And I was doing some travel, you know, it would have been European travel. It was all the major ski shows in the country. I was a product representative, brand ambassador, marketing kind of guy, you know. And this company literally went upside down within six months of being hired. And I was the last person hired and the first person fired when this whole thing was going upside down. They were going to try and save it. And then they started cutting costs. And I had my dream job and I was traveling and I was making great money. And I'm like, wow, I, I've worked so hard to get to this point. And then all of a sudden, there's my boss again at the door with the cardboard box. I'm like, this is happening again. So again, if, if, if I had done anything differently, I would have just followed, you know, a ski industry career and and risen up and I could have seen myself being an executive for a top resort, a resort group, that sort of thing, because I ultimately worked in the ski industry while I was starting that restaurant for that resort I told you about. And I have friends to this day that are still in the business. 
And I love visiting them and, and seeing their careers flying and, and they have the lifestyle. They ski a lot and they travel a lot and they've got families and, you know, yeah. But, but for me, it really was more about entrepreneurship. So, you know, I could have gone down that ski industry road and been very happy, but I think, I think just the entrepreneurial thing ended up being right for me. And I have no regrets, even though, you know, there's been lots of bumps in the road and, you know, hurry up and wait. And sometimes things don't happen as fast. And it's a very tentative lifestyle too. sometimes entrepreneurship. Some people are overnight successes and some people take much, much longer to find their ultimate true success. And I would say I'm, I'm one of those people. And again, life's a journey, not a destination. Yeah, no, I know. I love that. I think, um, you know, you know, you've heard it a million times, you know, nothing good comes easy. And if it was so easy, everybody would do it. Um, so, you know, when I hear you talk, I keep thinking of the advice of just, you know, getting involved, taking action and letting things happen. And, you know, you never know where that person, that person you meet or that next job is going to lead you. But, you know, you should pay attention to, you know, like your interest in serving and hospitality and being in that vibe of restaurants, music, people are happy, people are drinking, people are celebrating birthdays, people are, you know, all of that stuff like that you and I experienced in Sun Valley, hanging out, having drinks in the right. lodge. I love that. I love watching people yeah. smile, Me laugh, too. talk about a great day, uh, you know, hitting the powder, uh, being outside in the sun. I mean, those are some of my favorite, you know, my wife and I watching our kids walk up river run when they were six, you know, seven, eight years old and uh, ski down. I mean, those are those Absolutely. are priceless memories, they but are. I appreciate it, Roger. Uh, I really look up to you. I think you um, are doing some cool stuff in the restaurant business, and uh, I appreciate you sharing your experience with my guests today. It's been such a great time just catching up with you again, Dirk, and sharing anything that I can with your audience. So thank you so much for having me on the show. Thanks, buddy. We'll talk soon. I hope so. Thank you.